are sea oils harmful for humans? My friend Lane Norton and I recently went back and forth a bit on X, Twitter, about this topic, and Lane recently did What's a up, video guys? on YouTube breaking down his position about seed oils and human health. We are back. We have what will undoubtedly be the most hated video in the history of my videos about seed oils. Are they harmful? Are they gonna kill you? What does the research say? Lane's position is that seed oils are neutral, neutral or beneficial or for humans. And he listed many studies in that YouTube video that he did. And so in this video, I wanted to respond to Lane's position and offer some other studies suggesting different ways that seed oils might be harmful to humans. I'm going to try and make this one as succinct as possible. A full seed oils discussion slash debate will hopefully happen at some point in the future, but I don't think anyone wants to listen to two and a half hours of this. So I'm gonna try and keep this one high level. I'm gonna show studies to support my position in response to many of Lane's points, but hopefully a full discussion will happen as I suggested. But first, before you hate it, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment below the algorithm. So let's start with the human randomized controlled trials. Lane has appropriately pointed out that these are probably the first thing to look at. I will disagree with Lane's position, which is that when you look at the human randomized controlled trials as a whole, they are neutral or beneficial in favor of seed oils. I think the tricky thing here is that we're looking at a couple of meta-analyses, one by Hamley and one by Mazafarian. And I'll show those meta-analyses in a moment, but also it's important to point out that Lane left out a meta-analysis by Chris Ramsden and the reasons for that will be clear in a moment. Even looking at Hamley's meta-analysis, there are some pretty important things that I think have been left out of this conversation regarding human randomized controlled trials and seed oils. High level, the point here is that in the majority of trials that show that seed oils are neutral or beneficial for humans in terms of cardiovascular disease outcomes, heart disease, et cetera, a control group in these human randomized controlled trials is a group that was eating more saturated fat. The experimental groups were often given some type of seed oil to have more polyunsaturated fats, and they were followed for varying amounts of time. There are 10 randomized controlled trials in humans. Let's go through all of them briefly. I have a whole thread on X about this if you want the full breakdown. But I think in the end, you will understand my position, which is that there are only a few trials done with seed oils in humans that should really even be considered here because the majority of trials, like I said, have control groups that are flawed, significantly higher amounts of trans fats, or problems with randomization, as we'll see in the LA Veterans Trials. So let's briefly talk about all 10 randomized controlled trials in humans, and then we'll go from there. So you can see that this is the meta-analysis by Stephen Hamley, the effect of replacing saturated fat with mostly omega-6 polyunsaturated fat on coronary heart disease, a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. This is one of the meta-analyses that Lane cites. And even in this paper, as you can see, Hamley points out that in some of the diet heart trials, only the experimental group, the high omega-6 PUFA group, received advice to avoid major sources of industrial trans fats, such as common lard and margarines, shortenings, and or hydrogenated oils, while in the other trials, the experimental group were provided with a lower amount of these foods compared to the control group. And he gives the references for all of these trials. We'll go through all of them in a moment. He has earlier meta-analyses here, which he notes. Here's the Mazafarian meta-analysis, which will be hampered by the same issues we're talking about with this one, because again, when we exclude all of these trials in which the control group either received significantly higher amounts of trans fats or only the experimental group was cautioned to avoid trans fats, we're left with three trials, which I'll talk about. Minnesota Coronary, Sydney Diet Heart, and the Rose Corn Oil Trial. So if we look at all of these controlled trials in humans, what do we find? Rose corn oil trial, 1965, two-year follow-up, 80 patients with ischemic heart disease, 80 grams of olive oil versus 80 grams of corn oil per day. At two years, the proportion of patients remaining free of major cardiac events is greater in the control group, 75%, than for the two oil groups, olive oil is 57%, corn oil is 52%. So this rose corn oil trial showed that the control diet was better than corn oil or olive oil for freedom from major cardiac events. 
Only the experimental group was instructed to avoid trans fats, but the control group still did better. The only real criticism of this trial is that it's only 80 patients, and if you look at this trial, the results did not reach statistical significance. The p-value was between 0.05 and 0.1, so it was very close. As the authors note in this trial, the chance that these results occurred by anything other than a real finding suggesting that polyunsaturated fats are harmful in cardiovascular disease is less than one in a thousand, but a reasonable criticism of this trial is the p-value was between 0.05 and point one, again, very unlikely this is anything but a finding that corn oil and olive oil are worse than the control group for cardiovascular disease. Oslo Diet Heart Study, 1958 to 1963, five-year follow-up, 412 participants, a control group versus 76% of calories from fat from soybean oil in the experimental group. The problem with the Oslo Diet Heart Study is that the control group consumed 9.6% of their calories from trans fat. The experimental group was encouraged to eat more nuts, fruits, vegetables, and to restrict their intake of refined grains and sugar. And again, remember, the control group is generally a higher saturated animal fat group, and the experimental group is soybean oil. So the soybean oil group had less trans fats, the control group had 9.6% of their calories from trans fats, and the experimental group received more counseling. This is a very poorly constructed trial. The Medical Research Council trial, 1960 to 1967, two to seven year follow-up. Again, the problem with this one, only the experimental group was instructed to avoid margarines, cooking oil, cakes, and biscuits. The control group likely consumed more trans fats, and this is a mixed intervention with both omega-3 and omega-6 for the experimental group. LA Veterans Administration trial, 1959 to 1968, Eight-year follow-up, 846 subjects. This study has been talked about as perhaps the quote-unquote best trial showing that seed oils are not harmful for humans, but there are major flaws with this trial. The alpha-tocopherol vitamin E intake in the control group was 9.4-fold lower than the experimental group, 2.4 milligrams versus 22.6 milligrams. The control group also had a significantly greater number of heavy smokers and less non-smokers. 70 subjects in the control group were heavy smokers compared to 45 in the experimental groups. That's a very poorly constructed trial. Anyone who says that LA Veterans is showing that seed oils are neutral for humans hasn't read the full study and doesn't understand the flaws of that trial. The Sydney Diet Heart Study, 1966 to 1973, it's a two to seven year follow-up, 458 men. The result of this trial was that increasing omega-6 polyunsaturated fats from safflower oil and safflower oil polyunsaturated margarines increased the rates of death from cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease, and all-cause mortality. Interestingly, Sydney Diet Heart Study has been criticized because the experimental group received a margarine that could have had trans fats in it rather than the control group. So this is the reverse of what I was talking about the other studies. But it's important to note that trans fats consistently raise LDL cholesterol. And if you look at Sydney Diet Heart Study, the experimental group's LDL cholesterol went down. So no one really knows how much trans fat intake the experimental group in the Sydney Diet Heart Study got from something called Miracle Margarine. But if their LDL level is any indication, the experimental group got more polyunsaturated fats or less trans fats than the control group. Regardless, I think that some people would say Sydney Diet Heart is not valid. I think there's a strong argument because of the lowering of the LDL in the experimental group that they did not receive a significant amount of trans fats, but Sydney Diet Heart remains a great study. The Minnesota Coronary Survey, I think, is the best study we have regarding seed oils. 1968 to 1973, a 4.5-year follow-up, 9,057 participants. Interestingly, Ansel Keys was one of the original authors of this trial. His group hid the results for 16 years, possibly because the outcome was not what they expected, but no one knows why they didn't publish this. Eventually, Chris Ramsden found the results of the Minnesota Coronary Trial and the Sydney Diet Heart Study in the basement of one of the relatives of the people that was also involved in these trials and published both of these trials in the last 10 years. The results of Minnesota coronary study, those eating higher polyunsaturated fats had worse cardiovascular outcomes than the control group. This study has potentially been criticized because the control group received both margarine and shortenings as a source of saturated fat. But regardless, the control group still did better. Even if they got significantly more trans fats, the control group still did better in this study. The Diet and Reinfarction Trial, 1983 to 1989, two-year follow-up, 2,033 men with previous myocardial infarction. Only the experimental group was instructed to avoid trans fats, while the control group lightly consumed significant amounts of trans fats. So again, poorly constructed trial because the control group was likely consuming more trans fats, and this was a multifactorial intervention. The St. Thomas Atherosclerosis Regression Study, 1987 to 1991, three-year follow-up, 90 men with coronary heart disease. 
This is a multifactorial dietary intervention. The control group was estimated to consume 2% of calories from trans fats. The experimental group was instructed to avoid processed foods, cookies, pastry, and cakes, and eat more fiber and whole plant foods. Overweight participants were on a low calorie diet. So again, the STARS trial is a poorly constructed trial. There is more trans fats in the control group, and this is a multifactorial intervention. I know this is onerous, guys, but it's important that we go through every single one of these randomized controlled trials if I'm to respond to Lane's position that meta-analyses show that seed oils are neutral or beneficial for cardiovascular outcomes. We're getting there. The National Diet Heart Study, 1962 to 1964, a one-year follow-up, 2,032 males. And again, only the experimental group was instructed to avoid trans fat. The control group was instructed to purchase filled foods with either animal fat or hydrogenated shortening. And I'm quoting there. This is from the study. The control group was instructed to purchase filled foods, quote, with either animal fat or hydrogenated shortening, quote. This means that the control group had significantly higher trans fat than the experimental group. How anyone could consider the National Diet Heart Study to be valid is beyond me. The Finnish Mental Hospital Study, 1959 to 1971, six-year follow-up, 676 subjects. There was significantly more trans fat in the controlled diets. There were two hospitals considered in this trial. Hospital K had 2% of trans fats in the control group versus zero in the experimental group. Hospital N, 0.6% trans fats versus 0.2 in the experimental group. There were also a number of confounding variables, including differences in baseline characteristics of age, BMI, smoking, blood pressure, and there was a cardiotoxic psychiatric medication, thioridazine, used in the control group at higher rates, and there was inadequate randomization. So the Finnish Mental Hospital Study, poorly constructed trial. The Houtz-Muller Diabetic Angiopathy Trial, 1973 to 1978, five-year follow-up, 102 patients, only the experimental group instructed to avoid trans fat. The major source of fat for most of the participants in the control group was reported to be saturated margarines, leading to a substantially higher intake of trans fat in the control group. Remember, the control group is the group getting higher saturated fat, higher animal fats, versus the experimental group in all of these studies getting more polyunsaturated fats in the form of seed oils. What's the takeaway here? Of these 10 human randomized controlled trials, there are significant problems with at least eight of them. I think you can make a reasonable argument to include Sydney Diet Heart, but some people would say because of the miracle margin issue, you can't include that one. But we're really left with the Minnesota Corn Airy trial and Rose Corn Oil, and the majority of the other ones having significantly more trans fats in the control group, different counseling between the experimental groups and the control groups, multivariate interventions. So let's go back to Hamley's meta-analysis and look at his forest plot. So if you're not familiar with a forest plot, it's in a meta-analysis where the author will show a risk ratio of multiple trials and do a overall cumulative risk ratio. So you can see here, this is the forest plot showing the pooled relative risk reduction and 95% confidence interval for the number of major CHD events, that is coronary heart disease events. In the forest plot, he includes the DART trial, which had significantly more trans fats in the control group. He includes the Minnesota Coronary Trial, like we talked about. He includes the Medical Research Council Trial, which I talked about, having more trans fats in the control group. He includes Rolls Corn Oil Trial, and he includes Cine Diet Heart. And lo and behold, at the end, his summed risk ratio favors the control group. That actually suggests that the control group is having a better outcome than those people having more of the polyunsaturated fats. He's divided these into adequately controlled trials and inadequately controlled trials. Remember, this Hamley meta-analysis is something that Lane cites in his position for seed oils being neutral or beneficial for humans. Hamley also suggests these other trials were inadequately controlled, as we talked about. Finnish Mental Hospital Study, the Houtzmuller Diabetic Angiopathy Trial, the LA Veterans Trial, the National Diet Heart Survey, Oslo Diet Heart, and the St. Thomas Atherosclerosis. So all of those were inadequately controlled, according to Hamley, and you can see that those trials make the polyunsaturated fats look better. But we've talked about the major problems with all of those trials. They should be excluded from any analysis of adequately controlled trials as Hamley has done. So if we look at Hamley's forest plots, you can see he's divided these into adequately controlled trials and inadequately controlled trials. As we've noted, Finnish Mental Hospital, Houtzmuller Diabetic Angiopathy, LA Veterans, National Diet Heart Survey, Oslo Diet Heart Study, and the St. Thomas Atherosclerosis Study 
all inadequately controlled trials, according to Hamley. Remember, this is a meta-analysis that Lane cites in his position supporting the fact that seed oils are neutral or beneficial for humans. If you look at the adequately controlled trials, unfortunately, Hamley has gone on to include the diabetic angiopathy regression trial and the Medical Research Council trial, both of which we talked about as having major problems with the design of the trial because the control group was almost certainly consuming more saturated fats. Hamley does include Sydney Diet Heart Roast, Corn Oil, and Minnesota Coronary. And if you remove DART and MRCT, this relative risk ratio is certainly going to be significantly in favor of control groups rather than people having polyunsaturated fats. This is the problem with meta-analyses. It's easy with meta-analyses to get fooled unless you look at every single trial in detail because of these forest plots and the pooled risk ratios. The same thing happens again when we're looking at the number of total CHD events and we can see adequately controlled trials, inadequately controlled trials. We've talked about why the inadequately controlled trials would be excluded, but I would argue the DART trial and the MRCT trial should also be excluded from these adequately controlled trials. Again, changing this risk ratio to be significant and in favor of saturated fat rich diets, control diets, rather than polyunsaturated fat rich diets. None of this is controversial. This is clearly stated by the authors. These are clear flaws in many of these trials, and yet they are included in forest plots that are used to substantiate the narrative that seed oils are neutral or benign for you. Mazafarian's meta-analysis is even worse than this. His forest plot includes many of the studies that Hamley considers to be inadequately controlled. And as many of you know, Mazafarian, who is often cited by fact checkers as the expert on seed oils and says they are fine for humans, is going to come up with a risk ratio on his forest plot that says that seed oils are neutral or beneficial in terms of cardiovascular events. But I would argue that forest plot and that conclusion are foundationally flawed because both of these authors include multiple trials that have significant flaws in the way that the groups were counseled and they have control groups eating significantly more trans fat than experimental groups. So where does this leave us? This leaves us with human randomized controlled data, I would argue strongly in favor of controlled diets, that is saturated fat, rich diets versus seed oils. And I would say that if you really, truly, carefully, honestly look at these human randomized controlled trials with seed oils, you come away with the conclusion that in the best conducted trials, seed oils are clearly harmful for humans. Now in his video, Lane goes on to provide other lines of evidence by which seed oils may be beneficial or neutral for humans. I will address all of those in a moment. Again, I want to keep this video as succinct as possible, but it's difficult when we actually look at things in detail. Before I do that, I will briefly present part of my case about why seed oils are harmful. Again, to fully dive into this, it's probably a three hour video, but high level, there are multiple trials showing that more linoleic acid, this 18 carbon omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acid is consumed. There is an increased amount of oxidized LDL in humans, which makes sense because if you populate the membranes of your cells, your mitochondria and your membranes of your low density lipoprotein cholesterol particles with more linoleic acid, that polyunsaturated fat is more susceptible to oxidation and potentially cleavage by LPPLA2, lipoprotein associated phospholipase A2, leading to an oxidized, non esterified fatty acid and lysophosphatidylcholine in the LDL particle. We know that when there is a lot of lysophosphatidylcholine in LDL particles, they are transformed from minimally modified LDL to oxidized LDL, and that these oxidized, non esterified fatty acids freed from the phospholipid by lipoprotein associated PLA2 are inflammatory at the level of the endothelium, et cetera. Again, this is very complex. I could do a much longer video to go into this, but I will show a few studies corroborating the notion that more linoleic acid equals more oxidized LDL. In the past, Lane has argued that oxidized LDL arguments are mechanistic, but I think that it is very difficult to find any universe in which something that increases oxidized LDL in humans is not going to lead to or associate with increased rates of cardiovascular disease and that is not mechanistic, that is just increased rates of heart attack, stroke, vascular problems, et cetera. So first study, you can see it here on the screen, effects of diets rich in monounsaturated fats on plasma lipoproteins, the Jerusalem Nutrition Study. In the interest of time, I will just show the studies and you guys can read the conclusions. If you disagree with my conclusions on these, please feel free to put it in the comments. Next study, changes in dietary fat, intake alter plasma levels of oxidized low density lipoprotein and LP little a. Strong increase in hydroxy fatty acids derived from linoleic acid in human low-density lipoproteins of atherosclerotic patients. 
and effects of oleate-rich and linoleate-rich diets on the susceptibility of low-density lipid protein to oxidative stress in mildly hypercholesterolemic subjects. Furthermore, there is this trial replacing dairy fat with rapeseed oil causes rapid improvement of hyperlipidemia. Again, the title is misleading. LDL goes down, LP little a goes up, which you can see here in table three of this paper. The p-value is less than 0.05, showing statistically significant increase in LP little a when people are given rapeseed oil, which is canola oil. Now, for the sake of elaboration, LP little a is an ApoB containing the protein that is different than an LDL. It's often thought to be a mop or a sponge for oxidized phospholipids. And if you correct LDL levels for the amount of LP little a in the LDL, you see a marked decline in the correlation, the association between LDL and cardiovascular disease. Again, for the sake of brevity, I will not go into detail on LP little a, but it is associated with increased oxidized phospholipids consistently in studies in humans. Lastly, I will show this study, LDL fatty acids composition as a risk biomarker of cardiovascular disease. You can read here in the results, OX LDL was significantly higher in the CAD group. Polyunsaturated fatty acids and the polyunsaturated fatty acid to monounsaturated fatty acid ratio, linoleic acid and arachidonic acid were significantly higher in the CAD group than the non-CAD group. So heart disease, more oxidized LDL, no surprise there, along with more linoleic acid in the LDL particles of people with coronary artery disease. Here in the conclusion, they say composition of LDL is related to atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease. High levels of arachidonic acid and linoleic acids could increase LDL oxidation and atherosclerotic plaques formation. So that is the oxidized LDL being increased by linoleic acid in the diet position. I also think it's important to point out that the breakdown products of linoleic acid are clearly increased with more linoleic acid in your diet. These are the oxlams or oxylipins. These are a series of compounds either derived from linoleic acid, the HODES, H-O-D-E's, or the HEATS, H-E-T-E's, from the downstream metabolite of linoleic acid known as arachidonic acid. But when you eat more linoleic acid, you have more of the HODES and the HEATS in your body. The HEATS and the HODES are all associated with many bad things. Five and 11 HEATS have been associated with obesity. 12 heat is associated with many negative things. 12 heat has also been associated with impairments in efferocytosis, which is macrophages involved in the removal of apoptotic, that is dead necrotic tissue within plaques, and defects in efferocytosis are connected with progression of atherosclerosis. So downstream metabolites of linoleic acid are increased when you eat more linoleic acid in seed oils. They are decreased when you have less linoleic acid from seed oils, and these metabolites are consistently across the board associated with multiple negative effects in humans. For the sake of brevity, I will just show a few studies here, but the literature on this is vast. First study, lowering dietary linoleic acid reduces bioactive oxidized linoleic acid metabolites in humans. Again, feel free to read these guys. If you have any questions or rebuttals or concerns, please put it in the comments. But you can see here that Chris Ramsden did a study where he decreased the amount of linoleic acid in the diet for humans with headaches and the amount of ox lambs, including the heats and the hodes, was decreased. This is a study looking at the FADS1 genotype, fatty acid desaturase, also known as delta-5 desaturase genotype, will influence your response to linoleic acid with those having the TT genotype having much worse reactions. But if you read this study carefully, you will see that in both groups, whether you have a CC or a TT for your FADS1 genotype at this risk allele, <clears throat> RS174550, you will have increased ox lambs, increased oxidative products of linoleic acid metabolism with more linoleic acid in your diet. There's also a very clear study done in rodents showing that the more linoleic acid the rodents get, the more oxidative products of linoleic acid metabolism they have. Obesity is positively associated with arachidonic derived 5 and 11 hydroxy icosa tetraenoic acid, that is heat, as I mentioned. This is perhaps the most significant study that I've seen recently that no one is talking about with regard to ox lambs and atherosclerosis. 12 heat down regulates monocyte derived macrophage efferocytosis. That's not a good thing. When you're down regulating macrophage efferocytosis, there's a clear tendency to worsen atherosclerosis, that is plaque progression in your arteries. It's also very clear that seed oils contain significant amounts of benzene. There are studies showing that seed oils, specifically soybean oil, contain three parts per million 
of benzene. Seed oils also contain heavy metals, cadmium and lead, as well as antimony leaching from the plastic bottles. Seed oils also contain phthalates in amounts that are 45 to 396 times those of bottled water. Phthalates are estrogen mimicking compounds that have been associated in a dose dependent fashion with a smaller anogenital distance that is a taint size in male humans and decreased sexual pleasure in women. So getting more phthalates in your diet, no matter whether they're coming from bottled water or plastics or seed oils is not a good thing. There's also literature suggesting that canola oil increases de novo lipogenesis De novo lipogenesis is associated with everything bad, visceral adipose tissue, high triglycerides, more insulin resistance, higher waist circumference, more incidence of cardiovascular disease. So more de novo lipogenesis from canola oil is a very bad thing. You can see that if you look at the fatty acid composition in this study right here. Now, what about cancer? Overall, there doesn't seem to be much of an effect of replacing saturated fat with polyunsaturated fats. If anything, there might be a slightly positive effect on cancer mortality by replacing saturated fat with polyunsaturated fats, but it seems to be a really small effect. One of Lane's main critiques about the seed oil position is that there is no evidence that seed oils cause cancer. I agree that if you look at meta-analyses of seed oils and cancer, the data can be very confusing and muddied. However, there is very clear data that the fumes from cooking oils, seed oils, are consistently associated with cancers. I mentioned that benzene, which is a known carcinogen, is found in significant amounts, three parts per million. And there's a significant amount of literature from Asia to show that exposure to cooking fumes is associated with both cervical cancer and other cancers, environmental exposure to cooking oil fumes and cervical intraepithelial neoplasm. You can see if you read the abstract that those women who were exposed to cooking oil fumes without hoods had a dose response corresponding increase in cervical cancers. Here you can see characteristics of non-methane hydrocarbons and benzene series emission from commonly cooking oil fumes. These authors clearly show that soybean oil, peanut oil, and a blend oil had significant amounts of benzene, toluene, and other aromatic compounds, which are associated with cancers when you cook with these oils. Furthermore, this is from an IARC monograph that is the International Association for Research on Cancer monograph. In this IARC monograph on page 389, you will see they say they found a threefold increased risk for lung cancer with a moderate to high category of exposure greater than 150 total dish years and an eightfold increased risk with the highest category greater than 200 total dish years of exposure to cooking fumes from high temperature frying. That is high temperature frying of seed oils with these aerosolized compounds that have been associated with both cervical cancers and lung cancers. For, so for anyone to say that there is no clear data that seed oils are associated with cancer, I would say, yes, I can understand why you feel that way, but in terms of the fumes coming off the seed oils, there is a major concern here. And most people using seed oils are cooking with seed oils. Lane points to a study in his position suggesting that saturated fat decreases flow mediated dilatation, which is perhaps an indicator of endothelial function. I think he is using these to suggest that polyunsaturated fats don't do this and therefore they're benign or neutral for humans. But if you look at the literature more deeply for saturated fats or animal fats in humans, you find that there's really not consistent evidence that animal fats will lower flow mediated dilatation in humans. Consider this study looking at the assessment of vascular function in response to high fat and low fat ground beef consumption. They say here the high fat beef intervention improved flow mediated dilatation relative to all their time points while lowering systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. Furthermore, we can note that high trans fat but not saturated fat beverages caused acute reduction in the postprandial vascular endothelial function but not arterial stiffness in humans. Again, trans fats but not saturated fats affected endothelial function negatively in humans. So the evidence regarding saturated fat and endothelial function I think is not there to suggest that polyunsaturated fats are so much better than saturated fats. There's actually not consistent evidence that saturated fats are even negative for human endothelial function. One of the other positions Lane takes is that polyunsaturated fats are better with regard to insulin sensitivity versus saturated fats. And he offers a meta-analysis looking at glucose insulin homeostasis. Now, when you look at the meta-analysis in detail, some interesting things arise. So here is the meta-analysis that Lane offers, the effects of saturated fat, polyunsaturated fat, monounsaturated fat, and carbohydrates on glucose insulin homeostasis. The problem with meta-analyses, as we saw earlier in this video, is that in order to really understand what's going on here, we really must look at every single trial in these meta-analyses that the authors are using to make a position. So this trial has over 100 studies in it. So what do we do? We look at every single trial. I'm not, we're not gonna look at all 100 studies right now, but I will show you that if you look at the trials, 
used in this meta-analysis in which saturated fat was replaced by polyunsaturated fat, a disturbing trend emerges. Look at this. In order to do this, we must go to the supplementary material, look at table S1, and when we have these dietary arms, I went through and looked at every single trial which had PUFA and SFA. As you can see here, I wanna see trials in which polyunsaturated fat was compared directly to saturated fat. So there are over 100 trials, there are 102 randomized controlled trials in this meta-analysis, but many of these trials compare monounsaturated fat to polyunsaturated fat, or monounsaturated fat to polyunsaturated fat, or high carbohydrate to low carbohydrate. So I went through and looked at every single study that had polyunsaturated fat to saturated fat. And what I found was that the majority of these trials, in fact, there was only one of these trials that didn't clearly have significant amounts of trans fats included in the saturated fat that was being used relative to polyunsaturated fat. So this is the problem with meta-analyses. We must go through and look at all of these trials in detail. It is not enough to simply read the abstract and the conclusions of a meta-analysis. So again, when we're looking at glucose insulin homeostasis, the meta-analyses are foundationally flawed with every single trial except one showing significant amounts of trans fats included in the saturated fat arms relative to polyunsaturated fats. So we see this over and over and over in nutritional studies that saturated fat all saturated fats are not created equally. We know that trans fats are harmful for the endothelium, harmful in terms of insulin resistance versus insulin sensitivity. Replacing saturated fat that contains significant amounts of trans fats with polyunsaturated fat tells us nothing about replacing animal fats, tallow, butter, or ghee with polyunsaturated seed oils in terms of insulin resistance. So this type of a conclusion that Lane is drawing is fundamentally flawed because of problems with this meta-analysis, but we must look at the details as we saw with the human randomized controlled trials with seed oils at the beginning of this video. The last thing I'll say with regard to polyunsaturated fats and insulin sensitivity is that this issue is complex and long-term insulin resistance is driven by dysfunction at the level of our fat cells, adipocytes. I've done whole videos on this. High level, there is a defect in the ability of our adipocytes to divide. That is called hyperplasia versus GROW, which is hypertrophy. We know that adipocytes of those who are insulin resistant, pathologically insulin resistant, cannot do this adipocyte division, the hyperplasia, they can only do hypertrophy, these fat cells hypertrophy, they become necrotic, they become inflamed, they release lipokines and other inflammatory meteors, and that is really at the root of pathological systemic insulin resistance. Now, how these adipocytes get to that position is controversial. My position is that increased amounts of linoleic acid and other polyunsaturated fats accumulate in adipocytes, leading to this dysfunction long-term. There is evidence that 4-HNE, 4-hydroxynonanol, a breakdown product of, you guessed it, linoleic acid, will cause adipocytes to dysfunction and to behave pathologically just like they do in insulin resistance. As you can see here in this paper, 4-hydroxynonanol causes impairment of human subcutaneous adipogenesis and induction of adipocyte insulin resistance. Again, this is a hypothesis, this is not proven, but I think the conclusions here are pretty clear that a breakdown product of linoleic acid, 4-hydroxynonanol, that's where it comes from, is involved in the long-term progression toward pathological insulin resistance. Now, I also believe that linoleic acid is potentially causing short-term pathological insulin sensitivity, which we can see in this study which Lane offers as a support for his position, but I think this study actually suggests the opposite. This is differential metabolic effects of saturated versus polyunsaturated fats in ketogenic diets. Now remember that if you are on a ketogenic diet, that is physiologic insulin resistance. And what we see in this study is when people do ketogenic diets with polyunsaturated fats, they become insulin sensitive. That's not how human physiology is supposed to work. I believe this is indicative of pathological insulin sensitization by polyunsaturated fats. And we can clearly see that with ketogenic diets. Again, when you are on a ketogenic diet, you are supposed to become physiologically insulin resistant. Your muscles, other tissues of your body refuse glucose to spare it for the brain, testicles, adrenals, and other tissues that prefer glucose as a fuel. Now, if you give someone polyunsaturated fats in their ketogenic diet, they are more insulin sensitive and that is not how human physiology is supposed to work. You can see here insulin sensitivity goes up when people are using polyunsaturated fats in their ketogenic diet. That's not how it's supposed to go. That's not how normal human physiology works. This is getting a little technical and it all deserves much more consideration, but I would suggest that even one of the papers that Lane uses to suggest that seed oils improve insulin sensitivity is actually showing that they're doing something to mess with normal human metabolism that could long-term lead to pathological insulin resistance 
at the level of the adipocyte. In summary, if we look at the human randomized controlled trials, the majority of them are foundationally flawed with significantly higher amounts of trans fats in the control groups, inadequate randomization, multivariable interventions, and the best trials, Minnesota coronary, rose corn oil, and potentially Sydney diet heart study, which Hamley considers to be adequately controlled trials, all suggest that polyunsaturated fats are bad for cardiovascular outcomes. So if we're just looking at human randomized controlled trials, you have seed oils clearly being harmful for cardiovascular outcomes. Other authors like Ramsden have come to the same conclusion in their meta-analyses, meta-analyses that Lane leaves out. I've gone through other points in this video showing how I think seed oils are harmful for humans, increased oxidized LDL, increased production of oxidative products of linoleic acid metabolism, benzene, phthalates, heavy metals, cooking fumes related to cancer, et cetera. I've also discussed why I don't think arguments regarding flow-mediated dilatation or insulin sensitization for polyunsaturated fats hold any merit. So that is my response to Lane. I appreciate these conversations. I think this is how we all learn. And I look forward to further in-person conversations to flesh this all out so that we can all understand what the healthiest way to live is.